What do you do with your hands? Get your hands out my pockets. <clears throat> wow. What a reference. How many people do you think got it? <sighs> Not me. The black people here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even hear it. This is Hard Reset, a series about rebuilding our world from scratch. Hello and welcome to the Hard Reset Podcast. I'm Nick Tucker. I'm here with Taylor Hamilton. Hi. We are the co-creators of Hard Reset, which is a series on Freethink that is all about how we might rebuild the world from scratch. And as part of the show, we get to go and interview the people who are inventing the technologies or the innovations that would allow us to rebuild the world from scratch. We're joined today by Rob Chapman-Smith. Hi, I'm the editor-in-chief of Freethink. And Toby Morishano. I am the community manager at Freethink. This episode of the podcast, we're going to be talking about hard resetting the sidewalk, which is kind of a strange thing to say, but that is exactly what we did an episode about. We focused on the folks at Gell and Rebar and what they've done to reinvent how we use the public right-of-way, sidewalks, and how they interface with streets, buildings, people, businesses, etc. So in the podcast, what we get to do is dive in a little bit deeper, talk about some of the things we didn't get a chance to cover in that episode, and actually respond to some of your questions. You guys bring up great comments, great suggestions, and great questions in the comments, so we want to make sure that we try to address those as much as we can. It's a great episode. If you haven't seen it yet, please look in the description below for a link. And make sure you check it out. What is this a hard reset for? <laughs> I knew I would be asked this question. <laughs> I mean, I still didn't prepare. this is it's literally the first thing I ask you every episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think where this episode was uh, was spawned by was, you know, we both live in San Francisco, um, or I used to live there, and the sidewalks in San Francisco are pretty annoying from the standpoint of, you know, they're like about three, four feet wide, and there's a fair number of people on them and their dogs and you're navigating trees and now you have like a lot of delivery drivers and then there are these like little robot burrito machines that are like <laughs> on there. What? I'd have not encountered the robot burrito yeah, machine. Like, yeah, like, I think the delivery Coco, Coco makes them. Yeah, the yeah. delivery robots. I think Freethink has done like five videos. <laughs> <laughs> so sidewalks in a city as dense as San Francisco are fairly annoying because right. you have kind of a three, four feet for you as the pedestrian that's interacting with other pedestrians that are walking past you, plus people's dogs, and there's trees sticking out the side of them, and now you have scooters, and you have delivery robots, and all, all this stuff that's trying to be crammed into this relatively small space, and yet there is this vast amount of space for parked cars and cars that are driving and everything else. And so it feels like as more and more of these services and different types of micromobility come about that we just have way less space and we're trying to cram it into this really small space. And so right. there are people that are much smarter than me mm -hmm. um, at Gell, which is an architectural firm that have been rethinking sidewalks for, for quite a while now. And what should a sidewalk be? And really what should the whole streetscape be? And part of this does come down to just the amount of space that we dedicate for the sidewalk, for people, for pedestrians, really. Right. And so if you look at a street from one building to the other building, it might be, you know, 60 feet wide, and six of those feet are being dedicated for human, like humans that are walking. Right. And, yeah, the other, and the other space is for what we call dead metal. This is dead metal. No, not death metal, dead metal. Right. It is for cars and uh, mostly parked cars. Right. And cars, I think the statistic is that even if you're driving your car, it is spending 95% of its time parked. Right. Right. And so is that a really good use of space? Yeah. I love the way that phrase, dead metal, that you don't typically think of it that way. But that is exactly what it is. As opposed to living metal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's just inert. It's just sitting there not doing anything yeah. most of the time. You kind of hope, right? You don't want to be driving your car all the time. <laughs> right. So in a best case scenario, it's parked and you're not circling a block looking for a parking space. But um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a provocative way of thinking about it. And I think for me, what I loved about this episode was um, Blaine, who we interviewed from Gal, he and some of his uh, coworkers started a, a, a design firm called Rebar before they joined up with Gal. And one of the most provocative things that they did was they had, were doing almost like guerrilla street art, where they would find a parking space, 
camp out in it, make a park and pay the meter just as a way of showing what you could potentially do with this otherwise wasted space or the space not just wasted but really it's just a free subsidy to the car industry let's be honest like we have given up all this free space to make it possible for the people who sell cars uh to sell us more cars yeah and this is what back in 2010 2011 that they were doing this and they're like well what if this parking spot was a library or what if it was a movie theater or what if it was you know a place where you could sunbathe like would that be a better use of space and I think, you know, we cut to the pandemic where a lot of that space started to get used for different things. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it has made some permanent changes in cities. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting to see how that went from a, just a street art thing, (laughs) guerrilla art demonstration, proof of concept to what now is very common. It's almost, it's almost the expected thing for a restaurant, especially in some of these neighborhoods like the Mission District to have outdoor seating in a parklet or a shoplet, actually. Um, it's also interesting because the original parklets were very much that aesthetically right. pleasing, fun, playful thing. And a lot of the shoplets are just a shelter where you can put chairs and tables. Right. And they're way less interesting. And I think you have to sort of look at like, oh, okay, this was a good idea um, on several levels. There is the aesthetic and playful one, and then there's the pragmatic one. And I think they're both valid. But they are fairly different iterations. Yeah. Well, part of me also wonders, though. You know, I get why restaurants would, you know, extend out their their seating arrangements so that they can serve more customers, might not have viable outside seating in a in a dense urban area where you might not be able to do that so much. But part of me, I feel like I always go back to zoning laws when I'm talking about this stuff. <laughs> but like, who owns that parking spot in front of the restaurant where they have now put those tables and chairs and, and the coverage? And does that extend to other stores that are not restaurants? And so could a store rent a location to somebody if they wanted to? Um, I think about like fashion stores where that could be an interesting place to do some stuff or like grocery stores. There might be an interesting thing to do. There's plenty of like Trader Joe's and uh, Whole Foods in front of with the parking spaces in urban areas, like what are they? What could they do in front of their storefronts? Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be almost like a flea market style vibe. So there, I think there's still some innovation that could be tapped here that isn't tapped yet because we're just at the beginning phases of them exploring some of these things. One of the things that we cut from the episode was like a really nerdy deep dive on what is the difference between a parklet and a shoplet, mm. right? Because those terms are used or shop, the term shoplet isn't even really used. Right. But the idea is that the space that is in front of a store mm-hmm. or a restaurant that is using the parking spot for their commercial use, that is called a shoplet. Versus a parklet is really a park. It is supposed to be for the public. And if you go around San Francisco, all the parklets have little placards that say this space is for anyone to use. Even though it's in front right. of this coffee shop, you don't have to buy coffee to be here. I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here because... Well, do you believe it or not? <laughs> <laughs> well, I maybe I'll play devil's advocate and then devil's advocate, devil's advocate, or okay. whatever the term would be. Wow, double devil's advocate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very it's advanced maneuver I may pull. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I'm a driver. I drive. I live in L.A., and that's the practical way that I get around to most places. You know, right. I take the transit sometimes, I walk sometimes, but yes. fair amount of time you have to, to drive and it's convenient to be able to park in front of the place where you want to go. Um, and I, there's probably a lot of people who might be watching this who are saying, well, I hate looking for parking. You want me to have less parking? <laughs> right. I mean, I hear this all the time. Uh, I, I'm involved in neighborhood politics and anytime you try to take away any parking spaces, people flip out and I get it. It's frustrating. Uh, On the other hand, I do feel like parking along the strip of, in a a, a vertical or, you know, a linear strip along the side of the road is just incredibly inefficient as a person. Um, It means that, you know, one, they're cramped on the sidewalk, you know. I've got, I'm a, I've got a kid, I'm pushing a stroller, it's annoying. I can't bike, I might like to bike, you know, there's no space for bikes. Um, you know, if I'm eating on the sidewalk, there's like cars parking and like exhaust in my face, you know, as cars are driving by there. And even if you are still a driver, it is much, much better for you just as a resident of that city to have the parking be off street. Yes. Just as like some places like Santa Monica, for example, they have big parking, public parking garages. 
I've noticed a lot of the times, if you look around, there's actually a lot of unused parking in cities yeah. that's just not marked well, right. you know? Like, it's kind of surprising once you open your eyes, you're like, oh, that's like a gigantic commercial lot for like, that's never more than 10% full. Yes. Oh, I guess that's a public lot, but it's not marked. So I would never know that I could park there, right. you know? And I would just say that like, even if you drive, you can live in a much more beautiful, vibrant city. If you think about the best cities in the world, you know, the, the places where you, we might drive to like a, a mall or a walkable community. Uh, the thing that a lot of those have in common is lots of space for pedestrians and for vibrant uses of the public space. I think a lot of this comes down to what is the point of a city mm -hmm. versus what is the point of a suburb mm -hmm. and what do you want to li live in? And along with that, one of the experts that we didn't feature in this, um, but you know, that we talked to said that what we have in the United States by and large is a strode. Mm -hmm. What is a strode? Mm -hmm. So a street could be defined as something that is really for co commercial purposes mm -hmm. so that you can walk along, you can like look into all these different stores, you can walk in easily, you can walk out, you can see your friends outside, you can look across the street and say, okay, I'm gonna go over there, right? It's for commercial purposes. Mm -hmm. A road is for cars. It's to get you from A to B as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And what we have done by and large in the United States is to combine the street and the road, the purposes of both these things. Right which is bad for both it being a road and it being a street. <laughs> <laughs> so to your point, where we want to make streets, where it is about commercial use, that we should just make those streets. Mm -hmm, right. And where we want it to be a road where it's about getting in your car and going really, really fast, mm -hmm. we should make those roads. And so to your point, Santa Monica has done just that with like Third Street Promenade, where mm -hmm. they're like, this is a street, there's no cars on it. You can walk around easily, go spend a bunch of money, mm -hmm. have fun. And then the roads are like right next to it, you know, get from A to B quickly, hop on the 10, get on the highway quickly, and then, you know, get stuck in 405 traffic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Santa Monica still has a lot to work on, <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> but in this case, they do, they do one thing well. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting how we have prioritized so much of urban design mm -hmm. around the car mm -hmm. and the design of suburbs, the design of cities, the, the zoning requirements are all about car first. And you would think it would be people first because those cars are for moving around people. But it's it really is the car first, car access, car volume, car, car throughput, car parking, car storage, and it's bananas. Once and the you, result is really just a huge waste of space. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Right. Um, I mean, there's a famous design, there's a famous like meme that you might have seen where it's like, this is how many cars it takes to drive 20 people, you know, how many bikes, how many buses. And it's like, you know, obviously geometrically, it's just much smaller when you have the people or the bikes. Right. Um, and it's similar with parking where you're just like, you'll see, a, I'll see a CVS now and it's just surrounded by like 50 parking spaces, most of which are not used. And it's not just that it's, more parking than is needed. It just means that like to walk by that, I have to, you know, it takes 50 yards. Whereas if it was in like a denser city, you know, a, a street that was designed to be walked around, you know, it's 10 feet. Right. You know, the suburbs in the United States have largely been built with like giant parking lots mm -hmm. and you have like a Walmart or a Target or Applebee's or whatever, like towards the back of it. And then in the middle of both these sides, you have you know a, a road where you can go relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. That's how most suburbs are, are designed. And if you want to live in one of those suburbs, you can. Yeah. What is happening all across the world is that people are moving from suburbs and rural areas to cities. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that is that people seem to, and especially younger people want to like brush shoulders with other people. They want density. They want to be able to have like fun commercial experiences and like sit outside in restaurants. I think one of the things that Ava said that I thought was so interesting about what is the point of a city, right. she talked about serendipity. Mm -hmm. that I want to be able to go to somewhere and like, I, I kind of know what's going to happen, but like I might run into a friend right. or I might see something kind of cool that might be a, a person or, mm -hmm. you know, like there's this randomness that is really a beautiful part about living in a city that is not really what it's about if you're at a, in a suburb. 
Right. If I'm in a suburb, I want to be able to leave my house. I want to have reliable parking in front of the Costco. I want to get my big cart. I want to get all the things into that cart. I want to get back in my car, and I want to go as quickly as possible. Right. And you know what? There is a value to a suburb. Like, totally. That is, that is cool. But we should make our cities more like cities and less like suburbs. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think one of the things that, you know, it, it feels like for as efficient and sustainable cities are for human limiting environments, we haven't seemed to focus on making them as enjoyable as they can be. Yeah. And, you know, the trends in populations in terms of people across the planet moving into uh, and concentrating in cities has been going on for quite a while. Got intensified it a little bit more with the pandemic, but like, if you look at the data, the data is clear. We're going to be living in a planet of cities like over the next like a hundred years. That's just what the migration trends look like. And it would be great specifically if America got ahead of the curve and started doing some stuff to attract more people to want to come to the cities that are here. Yeah. Cause then those places also have a bunch of other effects in terms of innovation hubs and whatnot. It could just be making cities more fun and more livable. Just it would be a huge boon to mm -hmm. this country in general. One of the things that's come up in a lot of different um, videos we've done or looked at is that sense of like social cohesion, yeah. social isolation. And we did a, a piece on retail stores and what role they really serve beyond just retail right. it has a third space. Yeah. And I do think that and a third space to for to go off right. the point is it's not your work it's not your home right. it's a third space that it's cheers yeah. Right. yeah yeah but it's a place that where there is a, a possibility of socializing mm -hmm. or not socializing but being in a public place or a semi public place where you can sort of set the boundaries where you might bump into someone and have that conversation or you might not you might just sit and read a book or you might just walk around and look at you know shops and get inspiration or you might go shopping mm. those sorts of environments are really powerful. And I don't think anyone uh, doesn't want to have those. And when you do have them, you realize how magical they are. Right. But we've whittled away at the space we need to have those kinds of serendipitous interactions and uh, in order to make it more convenient to get to them. But in the process, we've made them places we aren't really that thrilled to get to. And that sidewalk, that little strip around each city block, uh, as it gets narrower and narrower, we've we've turned it from something that is really like this two-dimensional thing into something that's really like, well, I want to get as close to the door in my car so I can just go <laughs> make a straight line in and out. And it starts to be a one-dimensional mode of, of communication and, and transit. And that's a loss of something really powerful. It's more like a street for people. <laughs> you know, right, it's where it's right. like, this is from to get from point A to point B. Right. And I think I, I totally agree with a lot of what you are saying. And I think it's sort of wrapped around this sort of very suburban mindset that centrally planned a lot of American cities, right. you know, where it's like we thought the thing that everyone should want is a detached house with a car where you can drive wherever you want, park quickly and, you know, go work in the city and drive back home, you know, and, you know, uh, plenty of people to be fair. They like having their house. They like having their car. They want to be able to park. And that's fine, but it does not work for cities, you know? Like, I live in Los Angeles, second largest city in America, 75% zoned for detached houses with cars. The commercial areas have high parking minimums, so you need a lot of surface parking, you have parking lining, the sidewalks, and it's through this mentality that was like, the city is a bad thing. The city is a place where you go to get what you want, and then you go home. And right. the home is where you have fun, and you have your nice neighborhood, where none of the city-like elements are part of it, you know? Where and everybody knows your <laughs> name. But yeah, it's it's meant to be like a separation. That 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 was a necessary evil, but really this needs to be the emphasis. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up in Hollywood in mm -hmm. LA. And especially when I was growing up, like people think about Hollywood as like, oh, if I go there, it's gonna be like stars everywhere and glitz and glamour. Hollywood is a dump. <laughs> <laughs> it is like a crappy part of, right. of the United States in terms of just like the aesthetic and the vibe and all that stuff. And it's a great place to meet a drug addict who is dressed as a superhero. Yeah, serendipity. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but in the last, like, I would even say like the 10 years, like it's gotten way better. And mm -hmm. part of the reason that it's gotten better is that there's like a lot more high rise apartments and, mm -hmm. and hotels and like they are actively trying to make it more dense. Mm -hmm. And the result of that is that you can have a 
Trader Joe's right next to Hollywood and Vine. Mm -hmm. And you could have like all sorts of bars and restaurants and they're being frequented by people because people can walk out of their high rise apartment, go downstairs and, you know, and it's, they're trying to make Hollywood into like a proper city and it's not quite there yet, but like it's very much getting there. Yeah. Once you have the critical mass of people, it supports all of these amazing businesses and services and everything like that, that you can then enjoy. And I think people don't always connect the dots there. They right. think, oh, more people, it's just going to be more people in my way. But in reality, like the things that we enjoy about cities are made possible because there's so many other people there to work those jobs, to patronize those businesses. And that's something that's, I think, a, a hidden driving force behind the, the the magnetism of people to cities, even though some people might say, uh, you know, I don't like crowds or whatever. No, right. people people like cities. I mean, we, we were talking yesterday about uh, homelessness, mm -hmm. right? And that being, you know, a result of like a, a housing crisis and a housing mm -hmm. shortage. And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, if you want to be in California, there are a lot of places that are very affordable where there's lots of land, mm -hmm. right? That are not in the middle of LA. but. Mm -hmm people want to be like in LA and they want to be in San Francisco. Like they're, they're trying to inhabit these spaces because of economic reasons, but also because of enjoyment reasons. When you figure out how to have these like cities really acting much more like cities. Yeah. And opportunities, you know, where you have tons of people, you also have universities, you also have businesses, you also have people who want to, you know, hire you. If you're, for example, you know, I've had friends who lived in their van and they were like a contractor. They're just doing drywall or doing repairs and, you know, they can't afford $3,000 a month to live on the West side or whatever, but all of the work is there because there's a lot of people who want to repair their houses. So they just lived in their van, right. you know? And I mean, it's, it's you know, it, it's twisted because, you know, they are homeless, you know, they're living in their car, they're working, but that's also kind of when we talk about the homeless issue, that's like part of a spectrum. You know, there's people on the street who we might think of as homeless, but there's a lot of people who end up in these insecure housing situations. And then, you know, people like my friend, maybe they get sick, maybe their car gets towed or something like that. And then they end up going into a cycle of homelessness or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, we're getting off the topic of sidewalks, right. but you can sleep on them. <laughs> Jeez, Jesus. Oh. That's a hard left turn from Toby Morris. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, yes, it is off topic, but it also comes down to like, it does come back to like a sidewalk because like sidewalks and these like little squares, these little eddies where we meet inside of a city, like right. all this stuff comes together. I mean, I think when I was interviewing Ava, I, I talked about how in America, we don't have a whole lot of negative space. And she's like, please don't use that term. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the notion was that in the United States, we have really focused on what Ava would hate for me to describe as positive space, right? We're right. talking about, you know, what is the architecture of a building or of a house? Like we, we focus on that. And that you know, in places like Europe, they're really focused on what happens between all these different mm. buildings. Right. What, what is that? Like, how are people walking and meeting and where are they sitting and like, where do they get their coffee from? And then right. hang out and meet. And uh, the point of a city is the spaces that are happening between buildings. Like, right. that's what we really need to be much more cautious about. And, you know, this kind of comes down to back to like, how many cars do you want here? How, right. how easily do you want to find that parking? What is, yes, I have a car too. It's really nice to have parking like <laughs> where you want it. Right. But what am I giving up mm -hmm. for that? Well, and a lot of this is a circular argument of, well, I would walk, but it's, you know, it's not walkable. Well, it's not walkable because there's so many parking spots and there's so many parking spots because you refuse to walk and you refuse to walk <laughs> because it's not walkable. And so a lot of this just becomes a circular argument that is totally there to, to prop up selling more cars. Well, and what I love about making this series is that there's the other circular thing where you're looking at something like Zooks and what they're doing with autonomous vehicles. Right. And like, you're like, okay, well, these people are doing interesting things with urban design and sidewalks. And these people are doing some interesting things with regards to autonomous vehicles. And actually we're seeing these two things merge together and actually solve yeah. a lot of the same problems and challenges. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think the other thing that's interesting in terms of if you think about what energy we are putting towards the those sort of in-between spaces or those negative spaces as uh, um, as, as, as you're not supposed to as, as you're not, not supposed, supposed to say, to say. <laughs> um, we do see a lot of cities uh, putting up barriers to homeless people being able to sleep 
on outside. And so you'll see them like put up like spikes on like public benches so people can't sit on them. Yeah, what do they call this? Uh, hostile yeah. hostile uh, architecture. Yeah. yeah, hostile architecture. You're seeing a lot of that versus like what I, what I love about this episode is that everything seems so inviting. It's right. like asking for people to participate in being in a street culture, so mm-hmm. to speak, right. versus the opposite of that. Yeah, the, the term they use is user-generated urbanism. Right. Yeah, and I think, you know, we show in the episode what this, this firm did with Times Square. Mm. And I think one of the interesting things is like you think about like, okay, well, Times Square, what do I want to do at Times Square? <laughs> drive my car through it. It's like, no. <laughs> it's like, no, I want to be able to like walk around and have that magical like rom-com moment where I like, I look around and see all the lights and everything. Like it's supposed right. to be a, a walking, sitting space right. really made for pedestrians. And that's very much what Gell did. But what I think is super interesting about what they really did was that they prototyped yeah. that. They prototyped it in real life. In real life. They were like, okay, well, should we have benches here? And should we make gates here? I mean, and they they were experimenting. And a lot of what we do with urban design in America here is just like, we don't experiment. We're not yeah, playing. Right. And we some things are going to work and some things are not going to work. Right. But like, it's so hard because you, you zoning people. <laughs> <laughs> make it so difficult to just try something out. Well, not you zoning people. No, well, you're not. <laughs> I don't take offense. You're the good zoning people. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I like Blaine talks about this where he, he wishes we weren't so precious about our infrastructure. That right. In a place like Copenhagen, you can be like, well, you know, listen, there's a pothole. And somebody will be like, oh, okay, well, I'll get some asphalt, patch it. It'll be fine. You know, oh, you want to mix that in a wrap hole? Knock out some of these cobblestones. We'll put some smoother ones there. And it'll be great. Like, whereas... I can imagine trying to do that in San Francisco, being like, oh, you would like there to be a, a, a ramp there. Well, we're, we're going to have a firm come do the engineering drawing, <laughs> city hearing, and then we're going to come in, and we're going to close the street down, we're going to jackhammer that out, and we're going to put a super permanent concrete installation with rebar, and then if it sucks, well, you're stuck with it for another 10 years, because then you know someone else will have a problem with it. And it's just such a huge hurdle, whereas everything seems a lot more atomized and quicker to respond in a place where it's not treated so preciously. It actually winds up being better. It becomes more precious and it becomes a place that is you know, more responsive to your needs as opposed to a place where any change requires total consensus, and millions of dollars of investment, and you know this very narrow list of approved contractors who can do the work. It's bananas. This is not satire at all. And I didn't necessarily realize how not satire it was before I got involved in it. Like in my neighborhood, you know, I can't push a stroll. There's an intersection. I can't put a, push a stroller across because there's, uh, you know, there's no cut in the median, you right. know, and the light is too fast. So like every time I'm pushing my kid over halfway through, I have to like lift up a stroller, you know, hang out on the median of a busy road, right. wait for the light to change again, get down you know, go across. So just like an obvious fuck up, right? Right. The process to change this, which is in motion, is a multi-million dollar four-year process. Well, and I guarantee you, by the time you finish it, your kid won't be in a stroller anymore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, who is this for? I'm a resident of this neighborhood which with is, a two-year-old. Which is great for the people who would otherwise have to deal with it. Because <laughs> by the time it becomes a problem for someone, they start initiating the process to fix it, and then they lose the momentum and yeah. in- energy. So unless you have like a plan to have like three or four more kids <laughs> like see you through this process, there's always the risk that the momentum will die out. And, and that is so much the problem with the kind of bureaucratic institutions mm-hmm. built around changing public infrastructure. And the silver lining and the good part is there's a lot of ways for everyone to get involved, pretty much. I mean, I'm speaking as an American, with we have our own processes, which are not great, but they exist. And, but also, you know, wherever you are, there'll be some way to get involved. And we actually did a video on people who are doing tactical urbanism. Mm-hmm. So they're actually just not waiting for permission. Yeah. They're just changing streets. Right. You know, there's people who are like, you know what? I'm not going to wait for someone to paint a safe crosswalk at this intersection where someone died. Right. We're just going to get some paint and paint it. Yeah. You know? well, well, the first thing you needed to do is just get like a yellow vest and like <laughs> a hard hat and official badge. You, you can get a lot done with a yellow vest. You can do whatever vest. you <laughs> want. You know, like the Department of Water and Power came to my house and I was like, do you all work there or do you just have a cool vest? <laughs> They're like, they don't just sell these. At, oh yeah, they do just sell these. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and there's actually a lot, you know, for good and bad. There's like, there's a lot of curbs, for example, around LA that are not legally painted. People right. just paint them red because they don't want people parking in front of their house or their business. Hmm. 
for example. So like people take the stuff into their own hands and that's the risk when you make it so hard to engage in a proper way. Right. It's just like, well, then we're not going to, we're just going to do what we need to do. And you know, I, to their credit, we did a video with these tactical urbanists, you know, a few years ago, uh, check it out. Um, and it's like, uh, some cities have been like, you know what, actually this, this works. We're going right. to make this permanent. Actually, you know, why don't you consult with us? Why don't we use this instead of fighting it? Because this is the ideal of citizens who are, you know, making their streets better. Right. Um, and so there is an opportunity to get involved through like community meetings or whatever. Those are a long, long slog, uh, but also just like to think outside the box and, 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 and you know, do things in a, in a new way. Yeah, and that tactical urbanism, I think, again, with the pandemic was something that just just exploded, right? Yeah. Just people would be like, you know what? Why are cars going so fast down my street? You know, right. Like, why do we need to really have lots of cars on the street? We're going to make this a slow street. Right. Um, and I'm curious as to how many of those things, mm -hmm. since we're kind of out of the pandemic, have continued to be there. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I think uh, the pandemic just seemed to break so many things. It was mm -hmm. like, okay, that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> yeah, all the rules that we were obeying, let's just throw those out the window. Right. Right. And, and so it was a great laboratory for these things. And it definitely allowed us to say, well, what if we tried this thing that seems to work? And it's been a mixed bag, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. Like, shoplets have been a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. They're a little bit weird sometimes, and they're, sometimes they're, they're great. But they were clearly a necessary innovation mm -hmm. that has, whose time has come. And I don't think we ever would have gotten this volume of them in San Francisco without something like a pandemic yeah. occurring. And just the preciousness with which we had treated the streets and the willingness to experiment is so powerful. Yeah. You know, yeah, I've certainly seen like streets that were slow streets and everyone ignored the signs or they're knocked over and in the gutter. But I've also seen, you know, cases where that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And it's worth having a few cases where it doesn't work out for that one where people are like, oh, this is amazing. My kids can play in the street now. This is going to be the standard. Or it's worth having a few sh shoplets that aren't really that inspiring for those few times you go to a restaurant and you're like, wow, this is an amazing outdoor garden that never would have existed if we didn't, you know, waive the requirements of parking here. Yeah. One of the things we didn't get a chance to dive into as much as I wanted to in this episode was there are really cool, innovative infrastructure technologies that are being developed right now where you can actually like pull out some of these parts of the street and replace them, almost like Legos, where it's just mm -hmm. like, hmm. can, you, can you have a, 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 a material that's permanent and outdoors, but can be removed and altered without requiring you know, a six month construction project, <laughs> right. the sidewalk or the curb. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a bunch of these sorts of things that are starting to emerge, um, but they're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting is that a place like Copenhagen can do these really relatively quick changes because they're using an old technology, which is like cobblestones. Mm -hmm. right. It's relatively easy to like pluck out that bad one that's broken and replace it as opposed mm -hmm. to saying, well, we're going to have to jackhammer the entire street and patch this thing mm -hmm. here. Um, the curbs are relatively easy to maintain because they're made of these older materials. And I think that's kind of fun. I think that allows them to be a little bit more responsive to uh, the people who live in that city than our cities are built, where it's very much about like just concrete and rebar all day. The fact is that cities have to, at least in the United States, compete for taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And those taxpayers are going to be people and they're going to be corporations. And so a lot of these cities are trying to compete for the best and the brightest and the people that are going to be able to pay tax revenue. And what makes like a city really work, it's low crime, it's low homelessness, it's having great shops and being able to have a job. And if you get fired from that job, being able to get another one relatively quickly, right? Mm -hmm. And so this inherently is going to be a part of that. And I, I think part of the reason for that, honestly, is because our expectations around technology and how quickly like my iPhone updates or mm -hmm. how quickly I can get like the next product, that's only increasing yeah. for, for everyone. Our, our expectations of like great human-centered mm -hmm. design, user experiences are only increasing. And that's going to go into the built environment as well. I think the big question is, you zoning people, how much are you all going to get in the, in the way? Like how, you know, what are the governments going to be doing in order to like either help or hurt this process? I think this episode and this idea certainly falls into the category of like the frustratingly obvious 
in, in a way where it's like once you see it and experience it, you're like, okay, why isn't this? Why isn't there more of this? And why won't there be more of this? And I do wonder, like, you know, as there's competition between cities now to attract more people. You know, there was like recently, oh, folks are moving from California to Florida and to Miami and all things like that. But I wonder if there is going to be a mayor that comes along in some city that's on the cusp of being a big city and attracting more people and be like, this is the thing that we're going to do. We're going to really lean into making our city an enjoyable, almost Copenhagen-like experience and going to dig into that. I think Washington, D.C. actually has a really good opportunity to do that. They have pretty good bike lanes and whatnot. They just made their, they have a goal to make their public trans, uh, transportation free now mm. uh, for residents. Mm. And if they leaned into this aspect of it, that's close as you're going to get to a European city in the United States. Right, right. Yeah, I think, I think that the, where you'll see this change happen in a big way is in cities that kind of don't have any other options. I think mm, like a uh, Omaha, like well, or or Detroit, mm. and I think there's, you know, as a city gets more and more affordable, and because people have left it, the people who are there are probably more interested in changing things up. That's fair. And and where how many times have we seen a place that was sort of shunned, right, become reinvented by the creative and interesting people who found a way to live there, made it affordable, and then they made it so popular that everyone got kind of priced out. And I think those sorts of waves of innovation tend to happen over and over again. We've seen it in San Francisco, we've seen it in Brooklyn, and mm-hmm. we've seen it all over the place where, uh, and I think we're seeing it in Austin right now. So I think that it'll start to happen in some of these you know, marginal cities that are starting to, to, to become, you know, sort of looking at an existential crisis. All right. I think, so I've been involved in a little bit in California, and it's interesting because it, there's, a number of things that are in conflict with each other that people don't realize are always in conflict with each other. Mm. So for example, you'll hear politicians say, we need to cut out the red tape that's holding back our city. And also we need community led processes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and people don't realize community led process is code for, hey, Barbara at the HOA, come down to this Tuesday night meeting with 14 other people with an average age of 75 years old and complain about this loss of a parking space, you know? That's the community, that 0.01% of people who wants to spend multiple meetings over the course of years right. talking about these minor infrastructure issues. Uh, and they'll also th- say things like, oh, we need to you know, help support property prices and make housing more affordable. <laughs> right. And those are two sides of the same coin. You can't have prices go up and down, not at scale at least. Um, and so I think California you know, has a terrible and deserved reputation of being extremely, extremely slow at these things. But one of the silver linings is that we are, because we, it is so bad here in so many ways, it's gotten a lot more attention Mm. and we're passing a lot more legislation that's, um, that's helping it. The other thing I want to say is you have this notion of, we have to solve climate change right now, but also if we want a bus lane, it's going to take 10 years. (laughs) <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you can't have both of these things. Right, so like right. at some point, something has to give and what should give is pretty obvious. It's our attachment to this incredibly long, slow bureaucracy around any change in our built environment. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's also culturally reinforced because younger people are just like, let's have new shit, man. Like, why is, why are we, why are we in this, one of the greatest cities in the world? And it's just dilapidated and trashed and stuff. And so my hope is that, you know, with these movements coming together, we're going to see people really taking back our streets in a, in a physical way yeah. and reinventing them. In, in servants of the super hard reset episode, I wonder about iMod as it relates to something like this. Oh, sure. Um, cause that seems like, you know, cause many of the things that we're seeing right now with the shoplets, they're like, you know, wood structures, essentially kind of looks like a gazebo like thing. And it's great, but oh, some of them wish they were a gazebo. Right. That's very <laughs> true. But like they, they don't have power or much insulation, things right. like that. Yeah. Oftentimes you'll see something like an extension cord. Right yeah. Out, and it's pretty janky infrastructure out to some of the shoplets I've seen. But like something like an iMod, which is semi-permanent, can mm-hmm. certainly be moved pretty easily. Uh, that might be more fun for something like this. Yeah. Um, so I know a few people who work and have built some of the parklets and there's definitely a, a threshold where right. 
some of the park lots that are intended to be permanent are really well engineered, okay. made in this, you know, made really well. And then there are places that are, well, we don't know how long we're going to be able to legally have this shoplet. Mm. So we're not going to invest a lot of money in it. And so that's where you tend to see these relatively just simple plywood structures with right. a little bit of uh, two by four s s framing, but not a lot else. There has to be some sort of modular way to mess around with our infrastructure, which is a little bit of what I was talking about yeah, earlier with, with some of these new technologies yeah. where you can pull out parts of the sidewalk and turn this parking spot into a semi-permanent structure. Um, I don't think you need that though for a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And what, what's great about what they did in Times Square, what Galwood did in Times Square is they did it with paint and they did it with a few barriers. Right. They did it with things that could be pulled out within 48 hours notice and go right back to normal. Right. Because you know the fear is, hey, we took... Times Square, one of the most iconic and trafficked places in the entire world, right. and changed it. I can't imagine that no one was upset by that. <laughs> and there's just no knowing, like... Especially a New Yorker. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> New Yorkers complain all the time. Exactly, right? So I think they, they were really smart in how they approached that and yeah. said, w w let's make it 100% temporary and reversible in case there's a giant backlash. Right. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't. And so they were able to make it permanent over time. And mm -hmm. I like that approach of, listen, can we do this with a couple of, you know, jersey barriers and some paint and a couple of, you know, concrete planters that we could pick up with a forklift? Then let's do that. Right. Well, what I'm curious about is cities. I mean, you, Rob, live in Philadelphia. Cities like Philadelphia that were, you know, built when people were walking or taking <laughs> horses <laughs> around. Right. 1700s. Yeah. I mean, a city like that, a, a fair amount of it, you could just really reverse, yeah. like the whole car built, mm -hmm. you know, the the modern post fifties infrastructure that is there, and see what it's like. A hundred percent. Yeah, there's whole sections of Philadelphia. When I was watching this episode again, that I thought this would be a, a great thing for it to do, and you do see a bit of this in downtown Philadelphia uh, uh, with shoplets and parklets, but. I think they could definitely do a lot more. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, I was just in Cambridge in the UK, and in downtown Cambridge, you're like, this is a beautiful place to walk around. Right. It's really great. It's so walkable. And it would be a really shitty place to drive a car through. <laughs> like, what a nightmare to drive this place. Like, uh, kill me now. <laughs> what I think works about that is that this is a place that was designed around very human-centered modes of transportation. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we threw that all out the window in service of the car. Right. But we could leapfrog <laughs> that again, where we have these cities that, especially on the East Coast, where that were primarily designed for very different modes of transportation that could be more well-suited towards the future than places in the West Coast, which were really built around the car. Mm -hmm. And one thing I'll also say is, Sometimes I'm more defensive maybe than I need to be <laughs> because I'm so used to arguing with people who are super pro car or super right. against any sort of change. But like some of the best places in the world for like, you know, walkable, beautiful, exciting neighborhoods, beautiful places, you look at places like Tokyo, you mm -hmm. know, you look at places like Berlin, you know. Those are also places with a lot of cars. <laughs> you right, know, Japan right. makes a lot of cars. Germany makes a lot of cars. They have them on the street. They're built, but they also have great public transit and they have great walkable neighborhoods. Right. So once you have, you know, I don't know, 80% of people taking public transit or walking or whatever to things in their neighborhood, then the, the, the few amounts of time that you need a car for something that you can only do with a car drive to, I don't know, some other town or whatever it is, it's not that hard because there's right. no other traffic, you know? Mm -hmm. What I think is interesting about the two places you name checked is that Tokyo, Berlin, you have a lot of war that happened not that long ago <laughs> mm. that basically forced them to have a hard reset. Yeah. yeah. yeah what true. was going to be in that city and how Absolutely those cities true. were going to be redesigned. And I don't think that we want that anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here, so it's like, well, how can you actually achieve some level of radical urban design, reimagining of these spaces without having to have it get bumped. Right. You well, that and, and in a way, we had that with the pandemic, where we had a, such, a <laughs> such a reckoning about the way things were working in our cities that we were like, well, we can't have this business anymore because people can't sit inside close to each other anymore. Right. Something's got to give, and it did. And so... Short of a war, I do think there are incidents, but they are still traumatic incidences. I mean, I don't, I would not endorse a pandemic as a vehicle for social change. But since we had one, 
and it did introduce this change, we ought to start looking at the lessons learned and embrace the best of it and try and make that part of our daily life now. Uh, yeah. I, when we're not having a war or having bombed out sections of cities in the United States, but we uh, there are there is a lot of issues with like store vacancies and yes. retail vacancies in, right. in, in America right now. I was walking down a street in Washington, D.C., and like every store was vacant. And there's a ton of that in Philadelphia. They spent a whole bunch of money revitalizing this place that used to be called the gallery. It's now called the Fashion District, which is a terrible name. It's totally just a gallery. <laughs> All the stores are empty. Yeah. And so they're spending money. We are spending money in really expensive ways or doing some type of urban planning and design that people are not wanting to take part in. Right. And, and as opposed to something like what was great about this episode, it has seemed like things that people actually wanted to partake in. Yeah. And focusing more energy on stuff that people actually want um, as opposed to things that you, people think that they want uh, would be kind of a great shift. <laughs> or things that people think other people want. Yeah. yeah. The other thing that we haven't really talked about is remote work. Mm. Yeah. Right? And in downtown San Francisco, you had a, a lot. Downtown San Francisco is for working. Right. right. And so you don't have like a lot of residences. You don't have a lot of apartment buildings in downtown San Francisco. Pandemic happens, remote work starts to like really take hold. And now you have a lot of those big office buildings that are being converted into residences. Right. And that makes this all much more interesting because then you have like, okay, well, now there's 10,000 people that are here that are living in some place that used to be for office workers. And those people have to eat and get coffee and blah, blah, blah. Like all that is going to transform. Um, in the, the environment. Yeah, for sure. So Toby, I'm curious what were some of the audience questions and comments that we can respond to? One guess as to who you pissed off most in the comment section. The communists? <laughs> <laughs> we have one guess for communists. We have uh, another guess for... Mr. Y Mr. Yolo nothing and be happy. Uh, conspiracy theorists? Yeah. Probably the NIMBYs. It was the Dutch. The Who Dutch. are angry that you keep going to Copenhagen <laughs> and never highlighting their great Mixlandius. I would have expected oh. the NIMBYs too, or, or, or these people. Mm, but look, yes. they're it was pe the Dutch. people in the yeah Dutch Dutch YouTube got all over us. Oh, I love it. What was their What was their point? Because Amsterdam? they're like they always go to Copenhagen, and Copenhagen is nowhere near as good as all of these places in the Netherlands, which, to be fair, used to be car dominated. And then they converted them to be more walkable. You can find photos of Amsterdam in the 1970s choked with traffic. You can see the arguments in their older newspapers making the same arguments like, oh, no, it'll be, there'll be no way to park. It'll be awful if you get rid of parking spaces. Or I have two comments yeah. or rebuttals. One, <laughs> the number of videos I've seen about just this happening in Amsterdam. There's a lot. It's well covered. <laughs> okay. The second reason that we did that was that when we were doing a lot of development and research around, you know, like what is the future of suburbs and urban, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, where is this going? Gell, the architectural firm, kept coming up. Right. People were like, y you want to know about this? Like the people that are really le leading this, talk to Gell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we did. And guess what? Where do you think they're based? Copenhagen. <laughs> so. <laughs> so so because they work there, because, you know, we set a, a camera crew there. Copenhagen was like made a lot of sense in terms of them talking about it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, my wrong. Your apologies to the Dutch if we offended you. We we also like your stuff. <laughs> I guess, <laughs> but but enough. <laughs> yeah, but not enough. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Next time, make better food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We need to do a future of cities in Groningen. Apparently. In Sweden? Yeah. No, that's uh, in the Netherlands. Listen, yeah. I'm happy to fly out and film <laughs> anything if they're willing to pay no. for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was actually uh, extremely happy to see, you know, as someone who cares about this personally. Wow, like Toby, you're getting all emotional about I, these comments. You know, I, I, I love that. that that's I, I've can, written about free think, oh, yeah. uh, unfree think about this issue. Yeah. You can find, you can find me. Um, uh, but... Uh, you know, people were very positive. And I think there is a lot of, you know, you're talking about YouTube. There's like, you know, we, we got shout outs to like people are like, oh, you should check out Not Just Bikes or, you know, these YouTube mm. channels that are all about urbanism and reinventing streets. So right. there's like, it's great to see an international community coming 
you know, and blossoming around these issues. Uh, we had people saying like, you got to check out this thing that's happening in India. You know, you got to check out this ha thing in Australia that they're doing and this thing in Mexico and stuff. So, you know, sometimes we focus on America or San Francisco right. or LA, but like, this is truly an international thing, you know? Right. A lot of countries also try to, you know, kind of copy this automobile dominated, you know, sort of infrastructure and now they're going the other way and that's right. great to see. Yeah. Yeah. To be really clear, when we were conceiving the show, there's a couple things that came to mind, right? We were like, Hard Reset is going to focus on having a U.S. based mentality when it comes, <laughs> comes to this. I mean, right. really, like that, that's what we could speak authentically about. Right. And the second aspect of that is that, you know, we always talk about the line, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about these places where we're, you know, we, we try to talk to as many experts as we can to really start to see where they're kind of congealing and where they're talking about, okay, the, the future is happening over here. Like this right. is where the trends are going. Mm -hmm. Here's where you should talk about that. And so we try to like kind of start off with, you know, where our U.S. point of view is on this but then start to hear where people are referring. And right now, when you talk about future of urbanism, it's Europe that usually comes up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was also cool to see like a lot of, not just like ideological affiliation, but people like sharing personal anecdotes about how, you know, I am in the Netherlands and my street used to be choked with traffic and now it's beautiful and quiet, you know? So this, it's, it's great to see that testimonial of, you know, how things are on the ground. Uh, we did see, you know, negative comments too. Um, not as many, but you know, they're there. Oh, no. Primarily, uh, this couldn't work in my area. It's too cold. It's too spread out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sounds like he doesn't live in a city or she doesn't. Live in a city. <laughs> I mean, you know what? I, you don't have to live in a city. I always say, you know, like if you want to live right. in a more rural area, go, go do it. Let, ladies, let cities be cities. Let suburbs or rural areas be suburbs and yes. rural areas. Um, but cold, I don't necessarily buy just because we're talking about what Denmark, Sweden, <laughs> you know, there's right, yeah. places that bike are not tropical. Yeah. It snows in Copenhagen, I'm pretty yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. Sidewalks don't shrivel up in the snow or the cold. They, <laughs> they can survive outside. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. All weather sidewalks. <laughs> I was not thinking that. <laughs> but it, it is interesting outside. how there's, in, there's different approaches in, in, in some places. Like Toronto has a tremendous amount of underground infrastructure mm -hmm. because it does get mm. very cold there. Yeah. As cold so, as it is in this room right now. <laughs> it is freezing. It's like 65. <laughs> you guys are fine. Um, but I think like it's very interesting looking at like, well, there's another form of reclaiming the public right of way, putting right. it underground and treating the, creating a public space there. So there are other approaches besides just taking back the sidewalk. You can be a, a, a literal troglodyte and <laughs> live underground well, in Toronto like, for three months of the year. And in Asia, there's some areas where there's underground malls and stuff Absolutely. like that. You know? In but, Hong Kong, you can walk pretty much the, like the entire city underground and from mall to mall to mall. It's really, really weird, mm -hmm. um, but also kind of fun. I, I should also mention when we talk about the, the future of cities in, in Europe, you know, a lot of the stuff that's happening in Asia and the Middle East, like, is also super interesting. I, yeah. I think, you know, with follow-up episodes, it's something that we definitely want to tackle. The the line... <laughs> oh, <laughs> don't get them started. <laughs> okay. right. it's, I'm not saying it's a good idea. It's interesting. I'm glad you're saying you're not saying it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think most people are skeptical about this. I'm greatly beyond skeptical about it. <laughs> I don't think it's worth building a trillion dollar, hundred mile long city in a place that has zero human rights protections for workers <laughs> um, and serves no real purpose other than to say you did it. I'm highly dubious of this. So I think a lot of these exercises and futuristic urbanism that we see in uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are primarily to distract us from the fact that they have actual slavery right now, basically. <laughs> if I'm being totally honest. Yeah. Mm. So I actually wrote an article for freethink.com, check it out, about whether we should build new cities. And because this is an idea that has come up throughout history and it's still being explored. But like, hey, if we want to build an awesome city, should we just do it from the ground up someplace else? You know? And uh, I talked to uh, Elaine Bertad, who's a kind of legendary urban planner and uh, academic and stuff like that. And he made a lot of interesting points, which basically you have two options. One, you have, okay, let's build a city in the middle of nowhere. And then you have this 
enormous collective action problem right. because you, no one wants to live in a city without people already in it. Right. There's so many things that we all take for granted. Grocery store workers, grocery stores, police, teachers, schools, blah, blah, blah. All of that requires thousands and thousands of people if it's in the middle of nowhere. Plus you have that infrastructure, which you're, you're going to build infrastructure that you're hoping this is going to be a city for millions of people. But if it fails, then you've just buried like hundreds of billions of dollars in the desert, right. <laughs> which is probably what's going to happen to the line. Or you could build one of the world's tallest skyscrapers without any of that infrastructure. And then you have a 24 hour long poop traffic jam coming out of it, <laughs> as in the case with the Burj Khalifa. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are, I mean, there, there's no good reason to go and build a whole city where no one already lives. Mm -hmm. People, you have to respond to the market incentives mm -hmm. where people have collected and created a reason to, to build something. You can build on that. Mm -hmm. But there, that, that's information. Mm -hmm. the re there's a reason people collect in San Francisco and Los Angeles because of a lot of different incentives and influences. You, 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 to disregard that and say, well, we're going to build this, you know, modern metropolis in the middle of, I don't know, the Black Rock Desert in Nevada, mm -hmm. totally disregards all the things people are saying about where they want to be and what they want to do and mm -hmm. how they want to do it. Yeah. And it, it's bound to fail. So I think that you have to look at how people behave and build on that in a human-centered way. Mm -hmm. Humans don't want to live in a long 100-mile line. Otherwise, we would have done it already. What about the British? They love queuing up. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, wow. Pretty, that's pretty wow. good. But I think people want to live in places where they can feel safe, connected, meet each other. And if you look at beautiful cities where we feel comfortable, that's what they're like. They're not long 100-mile lines. They're not these abstract shapes. Mm -hmm. They're responding to the environment. They're often informed by the shape of the environment and the way that we would normally walk through the, these places or the way, you know, I mean, the first early roads were probably inspired by the paths that uh, people who were nomadic basically walked and they were informed by the paths that animals walked. Mm -hmm. So all these things sort of naturally evolve. Mm -hmm. and I, I'm very dubious of, you know, the show is hard reset. <laughs> I get that that's ironic, but I'm very dubious about things that say, well, let's just start from scratch and do it this way from white paper. You have to look at the human incentives and the human behavior that you're trying to, to enable. Well, it's also top-down solutions just often fail. Almost always. Yeah. And so when it comes to where people want to move and live, they'll just pick up and move. <laughs> Right. <laughs> it's the thing. And so it's, it's really, really hard to top down plan a city. I mean, China has done a bunch of this and ended up with a bunch of empty, empty <laughs> cities as empty a result. skyscrapers. Yeah. Uh, with uh, the ghost cities phenomenon. So I, yeah, I think it's pretty difficult to do this from a central plan standpoint. And when you do do it and it like kind of works, it also ends up being a magnet for a lot of other skeezy things. Absolutely. Well, that's the thing is I think people also don't realize how centrally planned our current cities, even in like America are. That's fair. Is that totally like, fair. you know, where people want to live, where the price of housing is enormous, you can't build more housing yeah, <laughs> because right. it's illegal, you know? Uh, you know, and, and the, you know, you can't build a restaurant without two parking spaces per right. table and stuff like that. Right. And so the, the built environment is not a reflection of natural demand in the way that people often assume it is. Right. right. Um, and that causes a lot of pain. You know, and it's sort of like, it, it's sort of like, you know, we had this idea like, oh, my two-year-old, you know, he's got a really cute outfit on. So we'll keep in that outfit forever. And then he keeps growing. Right. And it starts cutting into your skin and causing a lot of problems. So we've yeah. outgrown these constraints that we've put on us ourselves. <laughs> There's also the, the inverse of this. You know, we're talking about like big sort of industrial structures as we're talking about cities and sort of in this way, not industrial, but just like big buildings and skyscrapers and things like that. But we haven't talked about a place like a favela, right? Or yeah. Like, Rio, like those are, in some ways, those are very unplanned, right? Like folks aren't bringing in construction companies to build those things, they're building them themselves. Right. And there's not really codes and whatnot that are uh, part of that construction. But at the same time, those are centrally planned because it's segregated as hell and that's the only places right. that those people can be. But I do wonder when you talk about, is it worthwhile to build new cities? I know there's like attachments in some sense that people have sentimentally to places like favelas for lots of different reasons. But also if Brazil wanted to, like, hey, we're going to up-level all those favelas. We're going to get rid 
rid of all the unsafe environments. We're going to clear all the drug dealers. and We're going to build actual good, sustainable houses for those people. Would that be an interesting project to happen? Well, it, we, we actually, in another episode, do talk quite a bit about this. Mm. So um, in, in one of the episodes we did also with Gal, uh, we talk about, um, is it? Buenos Aires. Our- yeah, I'm trying to remember what the name is. Barrio Trentino? Barrio yeah, Barrio 31 mm. or Trentino uh, in, um, uh, in Buenos Aires, where Gel helped with re, you know, redesigning uh, of essentially a favela, where the city saw it as a problem, they wanted to fix it. And what I thought was really interesting about what Gail did is they actually went and talked to the people in this favela and understood why they had done things the way they did. Right. And there was a lot of great insight in that. No, there is. There's yeah. great reasons for the, for why these are built the way they are. And the changes they wound up making were really tactical. They were, mm. they were less about like, well, let's bulldoze everything and start over and more about, well, what if we just added a couple of cross streets here and there so that mm. emergency access vehicles would be able to get in easier and we could put in more infrastructure and could we reinforce these structures and the way that you're building them while maybe not aesthetically pleasing in the way we would think about it at, at an architecture school there's a really good reason you have the stairwell on the outside of the building. Right. Because it makes it easier for you to add a story and have privacy as people cross from one uh, place to the next. So I think we have to look at things like favelas and see all the wisdom that's built into it. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I was thinking about the favelas more specifically in terms of like, if you were to bring some of the intention that you would bring to housing and other parts of the world to them in a structured and organized way, could you take the things that the community members wanted and put it in a thing that's a bit more permanent right? um, and a bit more safe? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a, that's a definitely something that um, we can and should do. And I think there's all sorts of technology around that. Not, not dissimilar from the IMOD structures and right. like can we make it very modular for people to build and much safer structures? Yeah. That's the main concern I have when I look at these is, is this safe? Is this sanitary? Are we providing the right level of infrastructure? Right. Um, and, but I think they're, these places are very much the results of unplanned human, but, but undeniably human desire. Right. They work. They work for a reason. Um, they don't work perfectly, and we should make improvements where we can, but there's a great deal in there that's really valuable. Indeed. So I guess the last question, the most important question really, is what are the meanest comments we got? Ooh, we did get some. I'm just going to scroll past the YouTube comments and into the Facebook ones. Oh, <laughs> we're going into the wow. oh, yeah, belly of the beast. Wow. All right. For those of you at home, you should be warned that the language may get graphic. <laughs> and if there are sensitive listeners, you may want to advise them to close their ears. But if their ears closed, that's super weird. That's not how <laughs> most of you do this. this is propaganda. A simpler solution that doesn't attempt to impose someone else's will on another is start taking public transportation. Did Wait, see that one that coming? That? Ultimately, this promotes taking people's ab- ability to travel far and close to different distances. I don't understand this. I don't understand that at all. Yeah. I think it goes back to the people don't realize because they've, you know, the fish doesn't see the water kind of a phenomenon. Right. People really don't realize that the environment we live in is not naturally organic, you know? Right. Yeah. And so it's like, they perceive any change to it as imposing someone else's will rather than the fact that this neighborhood was this essentially someone planned. Someone else's is a, will. Yeah, is, is an exertion of someone's been will. imposed upon well, us. there is no free will, period, so. Right, turns out there's not. <laughs> <laughs> as evidenced by the fact that by setting a three-pound bag of York peppermint patties in front of me, I <laughs> proceeded to mindlessly eat two-thirds of that bag, I think, mm. I think already. Mm. Disaster. All that happens is that the wealthy get to lock off the wealthy part of town from everyone else because they cannot drive there. No trips to the beach, no visiting art galleries or museums because you just can't get there. The system, the distances are too great and the public transport system too hopeless. Cars are the great tool of a democracy. I, I would disagree with almost every <laughs> sentence yeah, in that yeah. statement. Um, um, s- suburbs? Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I will s- <laughs> White flight? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, but even just like outside of all of that, like how are they going to lock it down? Right. Like from a functional standpoint, like how how would you are you going to put up a uh, like a, a roadblock? Is it like a checkpoint now? Like I think they took a stu- a couple just, of Thor's. Just here. a guy with a rolled up newspaper who sees poor people walking in. <laughs> <laughs> Go away. 
Oh. I, I think the notion of expanding sidewalks, the idea is to make it more yeah. cosmopolitan and democratic, to have more right. raising and mingling. Yeah, it's it, yeah. more easy. Like most people can kind of move around without a car. Yeah. So. But I, I see this a lot, actually, you know, being involved in local politics is that people who almost always are themselves wealthier and live in suburban right. areas suddenly become very concerned about the justice of poor people who cannot afford housing in their neighborhood, right. no longer being able to get there. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it feels like a very fake concern. I wouldn't like, want you to be able to afford a house in a neighborhood <laughs> where you can't afford to park. <laughs> yeah. That would be cruel of me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, where is it? I think it's Aspen, Colorado, where right. the wealthy there have made it so wealthy mm -hmm. and have not encouraged any kind of like affordable housing mm -hmm. such that all their fancy hotels and restaurants that they want to go to, well, all of a sudden they can't staff them because mm -hmm. no one oh, can afford to live there. That's and right. so they're having this like problem of like, oh, oh we actually... We, we need workers here. So we, we, actually affordable housing is a really great idea so that you can like come and serve me my martini. <laughs> right. I don't know if we need to go through There's all no of that. There's no real vitriol in let's, there? Let's There's kick the curb. People who hate bicyclists. There yeah. are there people. That's fair. I was going to say, understood. I yeah, understand. Yeah, yeah. I will say- I've had I, moments. I understand that as a driver. Uh, I think it's underrated how much of that is- created simply by forcing bicyclists and drivers to be in the same road. That's 100%. I think you should just have separate lanes. It's to have 2000 pounds of metal going 50 miles an hour next to someone yes. on a bike going 20 is just makes no sense to yeah. me. Protected bike lanes. Yeah. Like such an obvious the, thing. the laws of driving are totally incompatible with the what would be the optimal laws for bicycling, which are totally incompa incompatible for the optimal laws for pedestrians. <laughs> like we have taken these three classes of transportation and forced them all basically into the same spots when it comes to crosswalks, right? Yeah. yeah. And I understand the intense rivalry and and tribalism here because when I'm a pedestrian, I'm like you car, <laughs> you bicyclist. I'm the pedestrian. I'm the best. Like when I'm riding a bike, I'm like, Fuck you car, Fuck you pedestrian. <laughs> and when I'm in a car, I'm like, I'm just going to run you all over. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, uh, I, I also do wonder about cultural norms in this sense. Cause like right. speaking of Tokyo again, I don't know if y'all saw like the celebration of Tokyo or for in Tokyo after the world cup and they ate like one, one game or whatever. I don't know anything <laughs> about football. Um, <laughs> But the celebration was so orderly. Uh, police would allow the crowds to like celebrate in the streets when the it was a red light, and then everybody would go back <laughs> off of the streets when it was a green light, so the cars could pass through. And I compared and contrasted like Philadelphia, which is just like takes over Broad Street, and it's just complete chaos. And well, as we know, Philadelphia has the the best sports fans in the world, or <laughs> or the worst depends. Well, we all know it's the worst. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't. Uh, so I do wonder about norms around this stuff, and if there is just like. Like if we had a different culture around just the way we behave in public, that uh, oh yeah, be and even from when the U.S. from state to state, there's a very right. different attitude about who is the king of the road, right? right? Whereas in California, it's very much like pedestrians, bicyclists, yeah. and, and cars are, are are all kind of that. Whereas like walking across the street in Houston, Texas, you got to run; like, <laughs> they will not stop for you. Yeah. Texas is just like. You're in the road, you're fair game. As far as I can tell, that seems to be the rule of the road. <laughs> Thanks everyone for checking out this episode of the Hard Reset Podcast. Please make sure you like and subscribe. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. I certainly enjoyed having it with these awesome folks and look forward to the next one. Bam, that was short. Good. Great. Let's go. Good That was fun.